Hey! Hi, this is Dr. Christine. And Dr. Colin. And we are your co-hosts for the exciting new podcast called Love, Love Scrubs, Scrubs, and Stories, Stories, where we dive deep into the world of dating and relationships and go beyond the people wearing the white coats, the scrubs, and the stethoscopes. Come join us on this journey where we engage in dialogue and share stories of love, heartbreak, resilience, and triumphs. And we also navigate our professional lives with our hearts on our sleeves. Please remember to subscribe and hit the notification button to stay up to date on all future episodes. And, and we, we look, look forward, forward to, to seeing, seeing you inside. inside. What's going on? Welcome back to the Love Scrubs and Stories podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Colin Zhu, and I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Dr. Christine Nguyen. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And so if this is your first time joining the podcast, just wanted to let you know that this is actually part two of an episode that we had you know, recorded. So if you, I would encourage you to go back and listen to part one first, and it's going to be totally worth your while. And then, and then catch up on that and then come back here and join us for part two. And it's going to guarantee you so much packed with so much value and insights that it's going to be really worth your time to check it out. All right, guys, we'll see you inside. Bye. Okay, bye. Absolutely yeah. agree. All really great information. If I may shift the gears a bit. So we often, you know, hear, you know, men, everybody, you know, men want to know, like, am I normal, right? What are the common like misconceptions or myths that you have? And uh, specifically, like, you know, we often hear a lot about like penis size, uh, you know, m- perhaps misconceptions about erectile dysfunction or any other common ones that, you know, you, you know, ha- have addressed that, you know, yeah. specifically, uh, you know, and we have an audience of healthcare professionals and, and we're like everyone else, like we have needs and desires and we're in relationships and we have sexual health concerns. And we often, you know, hear about these myths that sometimes that we may not, you know, have that education on that I think we'd love to hear your expert opinion on. Sure, absolutely. Well, let's start with penis size. You know, penis size is a concern for many, and for some, it's an obsessive concern. And there's there's actually a a psychiatric condition called um, small penis syndrome in which a person, you know, is very obsessed with the size of their penis to the point where it becomes disruptive of their, you know, daily life. Men have a misconception about what normal penis size is often from a lack of information, a lack of calibration, and also misinformation, not the least of which is pornography. Pornography is ubiquitous, and it's going to be the rare healthcare professional who has not looked at pornography at some point. And the men in pornographic videos are selected for their physical characteristics including larger than average penises, just as basketball players are selected for their physical characteristics. Mm. Because we don't really like to watch average people play basketball for very long. And we don't really like to watch average people have sex for very long. (laughs) So everything is outsized because it's entertainment. Now, these men have larger penises than average. They do. But that's how humans are. But the average penis size is about five and a quarter inches erect. The soft length of the penis varies widely because those two chambers I talked about, the lining of those two chambers is a combination of collagen and elastin. Elastin is a stretchy molecule. Collagen is just a strong molecule. And some guys are showers, means they are they are larger when they're flaccid and when they get hard, they don't change as much because they have a higher ratio of collagen and less elastin. So they don't stretch as much when they go from soft to hard. And some guys are growers. They've got a lot more elastin and less collagen in that, in that weave. And so their penis gets substantially bigger when it gets hard compared to when it's soft. But most guys size each other up in a locker room, when they're all soft and they see the showers and if they're growers, they think, wow, I know how much bigger my penis gets when it's erect. My guy, that guy, but it's not the case. Um, Most men are pretty similar when they're erect. It's just that men don't realize that. Uh, Women probably don't realize that as well. So the average size is five and a quarter inches and normal is two standard deviations smaller than that or two standard deviations larger than that. So it's about 
three and three fourths inches to about seven and a half inches is the range of normal anywhere in there. But you'll see these guys in porn with eight inches, uh, you know, and that's just their outliers, but that's why they got the gig. <laughs> the other thing that is often misunderstood is how long should sex be lasting, mm. right? Again, going to porn, you know, these videos, the sexual acts going on for about 20, 25 minutes. But a normal duration of sexual intercourse is about five minutes. It can be two minutes. It can be one minute. If all parties involved are satisfied, that's fine. But because these things are measured, on average, it's about five minutes. It's not a Cirque du Soleil, 20 to 30 minute, you know, acrobatic <laughs> endeavor. It's just, you know, warm, intimate uh, sex. Um, so that's another, that's another misconception. And then as far as ejaculate volume, again, in porn, it gets kind of funny. It's kind of ridiculous. Looks like, you know, a contractor showed up to do some caulking. <laughs> but in reality, uh, the volume of semen really ranges uh, from about two cc's to about six to eight cc's and anywhere in between. And some men ejaculate a, a lower volume than that, and that's okay. So it's, not, it's not a harm, and those men can still be normally fertile. And as men get older, it's quite normal for their volume of ejaculate to decrease. And then another misconception is, you know, how many times in a row should I be able to have sex? There's a refractory period, which is how long it takes for the body to sort of reset and recharge before a man can get an erection again or reach a climax again. And that period is relatively short when we're teenagers and, and young men. But as the years go by, we hit 30, we hit 40, we hit 50, that period gets longer and longer. And it's quite common for you know a man in his 50s to be completely comfortable and able to have sex a couple times a week, three times a week, but not much more than that, not easily. Or there can be men in their uh, you know late teens, early 20s who might have sex three or four times in a night. But that's that's a refractory period. It's different for different people. Some older men have short refractory periods. Some men have much longer refractory periods. And trying to have sex more frequently than your natural refractory period can lead to a source of frustration. Hmm. I see. And what about testosterone levels? There's always a lot of talk about, you know, testosterone. Yeah. So testosterone mm -hmm. is a very important uh, male hormone, not just for sexual function, but for, for health, bone density, muscle mass the immune system, cardiovascular health, glucose control, mental focus. And testosterone is um, often under-evaluated. There are a surprisingly high percentage of men over 40 that have low testosterone, some, by some estimates up to 40%. And testosterone does gradually decline with age. Low testosterone makes it harder to get erections. And restoring testosterone doesn't always restore erections, but it's part of the puzzle because a man still may have some vascular disease and low testosterone and you restore mm -hmm. the testosterone, he still may need help with the vascular disease, such as with, you know, the prescription medications. But if a man is given pills like sildenafil or tadalafil for his erections, but his testosterone is low and it's not addressed, those pills may not work. So testosterone is an important part of it. And there are symptoms that are classic for low testosterone, like decreased desire for sex, difficulty having erections, feeling worn out at the end of the day where you just want to, you know, plop on the couch and fall asleep, um, decreasing strength and gains in the gym, increasing weight loss, moodiness, depression, mental fog. These are all classic symptoms of low testosterone, but that doesn't mean that they are the result of low testosterone. Sometimes you can have all of those symptoms and your testosterone is completely normal, but more often than not, they're indicating low testosterone. And the most important way to determine if a guy has low testosterone is to check his levels, to do blood tests. And if the levels are below normal and he's symptomatic, then it's better for his health and his longevity to have his testosterone restored up into the normal range. For a younger guy who's trying to build a family, 
going on testosterone shuts off his sperm production. And so a different strategy for that person is to endogenously stimulate his testosterone. And there are a Mm -hmm. few different ways you can do that, such as with clomiphene citrate, which is a tablet that's taken daily or capsule, or it's isomer and clomiphene, or injections of HCG, human chorionogonadotrophic hormone. There is recently a new formulation of testosterone that appears to not suppress sperm production very much, and that's a nasal testosterone. And that has to be taken three times a day into the nares. It's a gel. Mm -hmm. It's a bit cumbersome, but because it's much shorter acting pulses of testosterone going into the blood and passing past the pituitary, it doesn't tend to suppress the pituitary and therefore the pituitary is still stimulating the testicles to make their own testosterone and their own sperm. The reason that sperm production is shut down when a man goes on testosterone itself, aside from the nasal testosterone, is because the pituitary gland is is sending signals to the testicles to make testosterone and to make sperm. And then there's a feedback loop like so many systems in our body. And when normal levels of testosterone are detected by the pituitary sensors, it stops sending the signal so it doesn't overdo it. Likewise, there's a signal that sperm makes called inhibin, and when normal levels of that are sensed by the pituitary, it also stops sending out uh, its signal. But if it gets that signal that there's enough testosterone, it'll stop sending out both of the signals to the testicles for sperm and testosterone. (laughs) Now, with testosterone in the blood turning off the pituitary, you might wonder, well, you got testosterone in your blood. Why doesn't the sperm still form anyway? And that's because the sperm require about a hundred times higher concentration of testosterone. That's what's in then what is in your blood and testosterone comes from your testicles. And then it gets from the testicles into the circulation. And the sperm is right next to the cells that make testosterone. So the levels of testosterone that the sperm see are in fact a hundred times higher than what gets into the circulation, Mm -hmm. the rest that your muscles see and that your brain sees. And so when you are at good, strong levels of testosterone from a shot or a pill, it's still way too little for sperm. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's why when you go on testosterone, your sperm production shuts down. It's reversible. It can take many months. But for the younger men, a different strategy is recommended. But for older men who are not concerned about preserving their fertility any longer, going on testosterone is better for their health than languishing with low testosterone. It'll prevent Mm -hmm. pathologic fractures. It improves their muscle mass, their ability to stay lean, their glucose control, their heart health, their mental focus, immunity. And studies have shown that men who have low testosterone that don't restore it to normal have shorter lifespans than men with normal Mm. testosterone. Wow. Mm. So what are the normal levels of testosterone? And, you know, it fluctuates throughout the day. And as Mm. I, if I remember correctly, we should really be testing if we are like early in the morning. Yeah. So the reason that it fluctuates during the day is because the pituitary releases that signal to the testicles primarily during REM sleep. So when you're dreaming. And so when you wake up in the morning, that's the closest you can be to that signaling. And so you, you've, you've, you've just gotten the most signal overnight and the levels of testosterone that have been resulting from that signaling overnight are going to be the highest in your body. And then they're going to dissipate as the day goes on. So that's the reason why we check it in the morning, but it doesn't have to be 7 a.m. I will typically check it up till about noon. The normal range of testosterone Uh, you'll see printed on the lab report is typically they'll say like 265 or 275 to 800. Probably a better lower limit cutoff is in the three, around 300. Mm -hmm. However, if a man is in the 300s, which is in the normal range, but he's symptomatic, that may be low for him. Another factor is sex hormone binding globulin and albumin. These bind up testosterone and make less of it available for the target organs. So if a man has a testosterone in the 300s, but his sex hormone binding globulin is high, he may not effectively be getting normal levels of testosterone. Uh, His tissues may not be getting what you would expect 
for a guy in the 300s. And so sex hormone binding globulin becomes more important when a man is in the lower end of the normal range to tease out if he's really in the normal range or not. When we treat men, we like to bring them up solidly into the normal range, not just barely. There's no harm in taking somebody's testosterone from 200 to 800 or 200 to 600 versus 200 to 301, okay? Hmm. It's not safer to run somebody at, you know, just barely in the normal range. And we typically target getting somebody into the 400 to 600 range. And then we okay. dose adjust accordingly. And depending on the modality we're using, if it's, you know, weekly injections or daily pills or daily topicals, we can dose adjust the amount or the interval of dosing to try to stay in that kind of sweet spot. But it's very common that if a man is on a weekly injection, that his levels are gonna be a lot higher a day after the shot. Um, but what you don't want is for them to be too low by the end of the week. So I do focus a lot on what is the trough of, what's that level five or six days after the injection before his next injection? And if it's down in the 200s, I need to adjust his dose. But if it's, if it's really high at the beginning of the week, then what I need to do is I need to adjust his interval. Maybe he needs a shorter interval between lower doses, or maybe he needs a higher dose at the same interval. But it's all about treating the, the actual lab, not just the symptoms. Because some people just treat symptoms and, they, and they're flying blind. They don't know what the levels are. I want to respect the time and you know, thank you so much for you know, the information today. So going back to when Christy and I were talking about uncomfortable conversations and being, you know, having been in clinical practice and from your expertise, what would you say would be the best ways to spark conversations regarding how difficult it is to talk about erectile dysfunction, performing anxiety, and just, you know, having that be in a safe and accommodating space, whether it's from a male to a male, or if their partner is female, or even just talking about, you know, seeking a professional to kind of navigate how, how do you bring, you know, what are the best ways to kind of bring this up to the surface to create a positive conversation? Yeah, well, I think that the key is to demystify the condition. Okay, so this is a condition that uh, that if you have a dysfunction, it's happening during a very intimate and very emotionally charged time. And so one can take this medical condition and associate shame, rejection, infidelity, you know, lack of desire. One can one can put all of these emotions and reasons on it when in the vast majority of cases it's a medical condition the penis that is having trouble getting and staying erect because of vascular disease or endothelial dysfunction is not a guilty penis it's not a penis that's disinterested it's not a penis that doesn't like you anymore um, <laughs> it's not a penis that is ruined because of an infidelity you know, in the past, it's just endothelial dysfunction. And there is a remedy for that. And it might be an early sign of, of more significant cardiovascular disease. So it's also maybe telling the person something uh, as a favor, an early warning. But it's not about shame and guilt and rejection and, and trust. It's about endothelial dysfunction, or it's about a lower than normal amount of testosterone being secreted from the testicles, or it's about a side effect from a needed blood pressure medication. And so I think if you approach sexual dysfunction, the way you approach all the other diseases that you take care of in your practices as a medical condition, an anatomical condition, a clinical condition, and try not to throw all the intense emotions on it that it's so hard to avoid because, hey, it's sex, it's intimacy, it's relations. But realize that this is a medical condition. If you were making love with your partner and you noticed that your partner had a cut on their arm, 
you wouldn't feel embarrassed to bring it up. And mm -hmm. the per and, and your partner who had the cut on their arm wouldn't feel ashamed that they had the cut. It's something is wrong with that part of their body that needs to be addressed and it needs to be fixed. And you would talk about it. And you would probably stop having sex to take care of the cut, right? And you're gonna have to stop having sex to take care of the erection problem. But that doesn't mean you can't go back to sex once you've taken care of it. Mm -hmm. Because you can go back to sex after you've bandaged the cut. But these are these are more often than not physical issues that that we should be able to talk about, just so as we would talk about any other medical condition that we want to make better for the person that we love, that we care about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And if it's and if it's performance anxiety, again, understanding how insidious that is and how hard it is to turn that off and how hard that is to control will allow the partner of the of the man with performance anxiety to not add to the anxiety. So the last thing a person with performance anxiety wants to hear from their partner is that, well, this must mean you don't love me. Mm. This must mean you're not attracted to me. Maybe this means you're cheating on me. Where well, the answer is no, I'm just worried that I can't get an erection and I'm releasing adrenaline because mm -hmm. I care about you so much. I want to please you. Maybe I want to please you too much. I'm too focused on it and I'm releasing adrenaline. But now I got to be stressed because now you think I don't like you. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if the partner understands the dynamics of performance anxiety, they can take it down a notch and help not make a bad thing worse and maybe help make it a lot better. Mm -hmm. And understand, hey, my partner is releasing adrenaline. They're anxious. Let's create an environment that's not anxious. Maybe we joke around a little bit. Maybe we do something different. Come back to this. Uh, let's not. Let's not amp up the adrenaline here. The Love Girls and Stories podcast is a collaboration and co-production between The Chef Doc and White Coat Romance. The Chef Doc is a wellness platform that offers innovative approaches to thriving and offers a self-empowerment book, podcast series, on-demand masterclass series, as well as a brand new app. The app provides self-guided education such as food as medicine, self-care, and resilience. Coaching services are also available, whether you prefer one-on-one -on -one or group type settings. Please go now to your app store, as well as Apple as Google Play to download for free. White Coat Romance is a dating app for healthcare and health-related professionals and students in the US and Canada. It's a lively space where you can find love, companionship, and build meaningful connections with like-minded professionals. If you're single, go to the app store and Google Play to download and join our vibrant community. We are deeply grateful for your support. From all of us here at Love Scrubs and Stories Podcast, thank you so much for choosing us. And enjoy the rest of this episode. Yeah, really, really stress well. Stress management. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Just stress management. <laughs> so, in, so in the moment, are there words of comfort, like say as a woman, that we may offer to well, help? I, well, I, I, think, if... I think it's really... Um, saying that that avoiding saying that you think that this is about you that you think that this is about your attractiveness or, or how desirable you are that that his erection is not working because there's some problem he has with you or there's some in, in, inadequacy that that you have because if he cares about you he doesn't want you to feel inadequate either he doesn't want to make you feel like it's your fault either that that's it that's just as bad and so it's about not going there yourself not letting that take you to a place of rejection and inadequacy and then conveying that back at him it's more about that and then it's about just saying hey i know that this is a common situation and it's it's easily remedied and we'll get back to this and feel free to to take, you know, see your doctor or, or we'll just get back to this. If it's performance, now, we'll just get back to this. Or maybe you want to talk to somebody, but this is common and, and, and lots and lots and lots of awesome guys have this situation. Mm. Not mm. that I've known them all, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So normalize it, not make it. Yeah. yeah because it a is big, normal. Big, yeah. It's, it's, normal. It's, it's a normal, it's just as normal as some people, you know, develop, uh, blood pressure problems. Some people develop a change in their vision. Uh, there's all kinds of things that people develop over the years 
that are normal. I mean, that's why we are in business uh, because um, you know we're trying to counteract the normal progression of of of, of aging and and the effects of the environment and diet. But then on the anxiety component, the performance anxiety, that's just a very, very common thing. And it's a normal thing that lots of guys experience. Yeah. Thank you for uh, breaking that down and making it very simplistic, right? Because at the end of the day, it really is about endothelial dysfunction, which you know is from heart disease and high blood pressure. I mean, over a billion people globally have high blood pressure. So it's it's connecting the dots, right? Instead of like you're saying, jumping to a conclusion. Let's, you know, take a break. Let's take it step by step and not judge each other. I think that's the hardest thing is jumping to conclusions and say, hey, you know, they're not going to love me because of this. Uh, they may not, they might think of something, you know, or like you said, infidelity and trust and so many things we can jump to conclusions. So I really appreciate that fact that you broke it down like that. Last but not least, what would you like the audience to know more about you? How do you want them to find you, your book? What would you like to share with us today? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in our community here in Orange County. I'm a, a partner with Orange County Urology Associates. So uh, happy to help patients that, uh, that, that need my care. But I think a really excellent resource for physicians and for the general public, for their patients, is the book. The Penis Book, and that is available on Amazon. It's called The Penis Book. It's by me, Aaron Spitz, and it is very comprehensive, uh, covers all aspects of male sexual health, and it's written in, in lay language, but it's very scientifically accurate. Even a simple pun might have a reference to a journal article because the pun was about a finding in a study. So it is scientifically robust, but it's very easy to read. And it's actually very helpful for practitioners. My PAs have read it. It's helped them tremendously in how they treat patients. And then my patients read it and they almost always say, man, I wish I had this when I was younger, or I'm going to give this to my sons, or everybody should read this. And I know this sounds very self-promotional, but I, but I think it is really a very useful resource for practitioners and patients alike for understanding and addressing male sexual health. Yeah, because especially like we were saying in the beginning, you know, things could be swept under the rug, you know, it's very embarrassing, shame, guilt, all the different adjectives, the negative ad adjectives that get attached and associated with it. And we wanna spark more positive, healthy, and safer conversations, especially for men. You know, yeah. men tend to not really talk about their emotions and this is highly charged. And so, you know, we want to be able to dampen that, right? So we don't- Also, jump also there's a fear of treatment. Men uh, and their partners are often, even today, still afraid that uh, Viagra might give them a heart attack mm -hmm. or, or that testosterone will give them cancer. Uh, or, or, or heart disease. So there is fear behind the prescriptions that are often required and very beneficial. Of course, we always are pursuing the natural state, optimizing the natural state with lifestyle and diet. But again, there are going to be many people for whom that will take a while or will ultimately be insufficient um, that are suffering now and, and need help now. Yeah, yeah. Christine, do you have any other last words or comments? No, I mean, certainly uh, I appreciate you so much. We appreciate you. This has been so thorough. You know, you've been so generous in providing all this information that it, it will help our audience and, and their patients. So thank you so much. Um, certainly, I think we need to just go to the penis book and <laughs> uh, <laughs> for the rest of the questions, you know, so I've, yeah, so I've asked a lot. So thank you. Just just have it as a desktop reference. I have it and uh, it's, it's wonderful. And uh, you know, it, it hits you in the face, you know, you know, literally. So, um, you know, I think it's a very highly recommended book. Dr. Aaron, thank you so, so much for being here um, on the show and being a guest on Love Scrubs and Stories. And guys, if you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe. And if you feel, feel like this is a benefit for someone else, please let them know. And until the next time, please say goodbye to Dr. Aaron. <laughs> bye everyone bye bye hey guys thank you so much for watching and listening to this channel if you enjoyed this please like comment and subscribe and if you felt like this was a benefit for someone else 
please let them know as well. As a reminder, this channel does not offer medical advice. All opinions expressed are ours and our guests only. It is for general informational purposes only and does not replace professional health care services. Please consult your own healthcare provider for any medical issues you may have. Until the next episode, whether you're in and out of your scrubs, please remember to love yourself and others and lead with kindness. Bye. Bye.